NFL Today revolutionized sports broadcasting. And we're talking with uh, Rich uh, Podolsky today, great sports writer and author from uh, up in New York today. And, uh, Rich, good to talk with you. How are you? Hey, Doug. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm glad I saw it uh, online that, that you had this great book out, and uh, we were able to, to connect uh, a little bit today to talk about it because I'm one of those uh, millions of people that uh, kind of got into football in the early 70s. First game I remember watching was, uh, or first Super Bowl I watched was the 1970 uh, Super Bowl IV. So uh, after that, uh, it all kind of took off with the, with the pregame shows. And I know CBS had one before that. Uh, but it was kind of a haphazard thing. It wasn't really uh, uh, what it became, but uh, I guess in 1974, 75, uh, that's when it really began, right, with Brent, Phyllis, uh, Jimmy the Greek, and Irv. Right, right. And, and uh, what you saw, the cover of the book, uh, that was that famous, iconic uh, black-and-white photo of the four of them, Brent, Phyllis, uh, the Greek, and Irv Cross. It's the only photo that exists of the four of them. And uh, we put it on the cover of the book. Uh, that was uh, taken uh, in 1980 when Phyllis came back to the show. But really, this whole thing started uh, in, in 1974. There was a producer named Bill Fitz who tried to go live uh, with Jack Whitaker and Lee Leonard as right. the host of the show. And it really didn't work. Uh, Whitaker was a, a great writer and, and a, a, even a really good play-by-play guy on the NFL, but he, uh, the show was just much too fast for him in the studio and he couldn't do highlights at all. And they never did get the highlights going, uh, correctly, uh, in 1974, but in 75, a guy named Bob Wessler came out in to take over CBS sports. And he not only wanted to go live with the show, he wanted to break some barriers and he brought in the very first woman ever on a live sports show, Phyllis George a former Miss America, of all things. And he also <laughs> brought in uh, Herb Cross, who was the first African-American on a live sports show like this. And uh, that we had, and he added, of course, Brent Musburger from uh, his uh, Chicago station, uh, WBBM. Uh, the three of them were much younger. Uh, they, uh, I think, uh, Irv and Brent were both uh, about 34, 35 years old. Phyllis was only 25 years old uh, compared to Whitaker and Leonard, who were middle-aged white guys. Uh, and there was a huge difference in uh, the type of material that they put on the 75 show. Everything was live. Prior to that, everything was taped on pregame shows. And there was nothing new, no news, nothing fresh on the pregame shows prior to 75. And then you got these three people, uh, and Brent goes on the air saying, you are looking live at Soldier Field in Chicago or Veterans Stadium in, in Philadelphia. And that was a tip to the gamblers, it turned out, on what the weather was. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, things were pretty exciting uh, back then. And then a year later, they had Jimmy the Greek uh, to talk about point spreads, uh, and Pete Rozelle uh, was dead set against that, but he couldn't do anything about it. And the ratings really took off. I had a chance, uh, I went to college, like I told you, I grew up in New York, went to college out in Long Island, Adelphi, and I had a chance to do uh, uh, some stringing, I guess that's what they called it back then, or assistant mm -hmm. producing, whatever you call it, for uh, a little bit with the NFL Today, mostly on the Saturday College Football Today show, but I got a chance to at least to see the studio and, and how they put it together back then. Now, obviously, everything's changed technologically with editing video and all that, but back then they had these bulky tape machines, you had a separate a video editor and a producer working and a, a I guess a logger that's what I kind of did working with each uh, bay to put these highlights together it was quite complicated back then right there was no digital it wasn't digital so you had, yeah, I mean you could tell more than anybody that you had to guess where the highlight would begin right and then guess where it would end and then go back and forth until you got got it exactly right and you know, they had to do that, you know, on a Sunday when there were like eight games in the early window. Um, they had to do that with eight different games and then then separate them and uh, write, write up the highlights, send them up to Brent. Uh, and Brent would, would be seeing them live for the first time when they aired. And all he had in front of him was a, a few notes from the loggers. And uh, he was just sensational going uh, from one highlight to another. And you could count down in his ear 
you know, how many seconds left in each highlight and uh, what city you're go- they, they were going to or bringing in. And Brett wouldn't miss a beat. He was unbelievable. You know, and, you know, I, I you can't blame Jack Whitaker for not being able to do that. Really, they had to invent a way to do it, obviously. It was never done that way before. So they really invented that whole system, which now is much easier with the way technology is. But uh, they invented it on the fly. And like you said, Brent Musburger, the best, probably the best studio sports guy of all time. I wouldn't say he was the greatest play-by-play of all time. He was okay. But his, his talent was to be able to be the traffic cop. Exactly. Uh, you know, Jim Nance, uh, who wrote the foreword for the book, said that uh, Brent was probably the the greatest studio host of all time. Yeah. And, you know, you can't really uh, come up with anybody better. Uh, Brent was at CBS for 15 years, and then he went to ABC and uh, uh, ABC and ESPN uh, combined for the next 27 years. And the shame of that was that he never went back to the studio right. where he absolutely excelled. And even today at age 82, he's doing play-by-play on Raiders uh, radio. Yeah, I've seen him a few times out in Las Vegas because he and his, uh, I believe it was his nephew, uh, put that whole mm-hmm. VSIN, uh, which was the gambling uh, radio yeah, network, Vegas, uh, Vegas inside at the Vegas South Point. Point. And I've seen him in the studio there in person uh, just doing the show. So he does, I don't know if he still does it. I know they sold recently to a big company. They may not, he may not do it as much, but yeah, that, that's what he's been doing lately with the, with the NFL, with the Raiders. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, but, you know, when Brent came on the show in 75, um, he was pr- practically an unknown nationally. You know, he was a big deal in Chicago um, where he was went from the, being a columnist for the Chicago American to uh, doing first radio for WBBM. And then a year later, he moved in on uh, become the TV director. Um, and uh, that was a good decision he made. Uh, they offered him about double his uh, salary at the Chicago American. And he went to his boss there uh, in 1968, 69, and figured if the boss would give him a nice raise, maybe he'd stay because he really loved writing a column. Right. And he was re- really great at it. And his boss looked at him and said, are you crazy? Nobody gives up a column, especially in Chicago. And Brent did. And he, he was, went from 13,000 to 27,000 a year. And, Five years later, the Chicago American folded. <laughs> so that was, turned out to be a pretty good decision on his part. And just reading and, your book, uh, again, we're talking uh, to Rich Podolsky. You Are Looking Live is the name of the book about the uh, classic NFL Today show on, on CBS in the 70s and early 80s. But uh, he could be difficult. I, now, I've heard stories a little bit about him. He's a, he's a you know, gregarious type of guy. He can just see on the air, but a little difficult to work with apparently, right? Or at least uh, halfway into it, he kind of felt uh, he was the big guy and he wasn't going to be moved out, right? Well, he, he was a very competitive guy. You know, somebody on a previous uh, interview said Brent had a mean streak. And I'd say I, I'd call it a competitive streak. Yeah. I never thought uh, it was mean. No, I think just highly competitive. You're right. Good, good way to put yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if if uh, somebody came in uh, or somebody mentioned uh, uh, something that was a, a piece of news, like the Greek did once, the, the Greek was going to go on the air with uh, a great piece of news that uh, Notre Dame was going to fire their coach, Dan Devine, and replace him with a high school coach from Akron. Well, Brent kind of stole his thunder yeah. right before <laughs> the Greek was going to say it on the air. And uh, that led to uh, uh, Brent and the Greek uh, – punching it out at a place called pear trees after work that Sunday. Right. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, yeah that, that was one of the things, uh, and producer Michael Pearl, um, uh, mentioned, uh, several times that Brent would listen to uh, summer on Brookshire rehearse their little bit for the pregame show. And, and their, their bit, they usually had the lead game of the day and they would talk about if somebody important was injured or something like that. And there were times when, Brent would throw it to them, and by throwing it to them, he would mention their news. Yeah. And boy, <laughs> boy, they didn't like that at all. And, and there was one time that first season in 75 that uh, Mike Kroll had to make sure that Brent and Mus- and uh, Brookshire weren't in the same meeting uh, for, the, for the Super Bowl. <laughs> Because Brookshire wanted to take him apart. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I've had people do that, uh, I've heard, you know, to, to me and radio. I guess everybody in broadcasting has had somebody do that to you. But, yeah, that's, that's not pleasant. <laughs> yeah. But, but get it, getting back to the – I mean, these four personalities were so different from whatever had been on TV before them. You know, the, it, it was what I, I refer to as the beginning of uh, uh, sports broadcasting personalities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now everybody emphasizes the personalities on the pregame show. But, you know, you got Phyllis George, who was only 25 years old, and she just took off like a rocket. Uh, within a year, she was on the cover of People magazine right. uh, because of this show. And, you know, she uh, she was toughened up when her year as Miss America, they sent her to Vietnam. She had to answer a lot of questions with the press about should we be in the war? and then. She got back and she had to, you know, go around uh, as Miss America for a year. And uh, the, the uh, women's lib group followed her around and picketed wherever she went uh, because they, they thought Miss America was uh, not a, a, a thing that women should uh, be involved with. Right. And Phyllis had to answer questions about that. And uh, she got she got tough really fast, and by the time she met Bob Wessler, the head of CBS Sports, and uh, he asked her, what do you know about sports? She was uh, very uh, mature with her answer. She just flashed uh, those dimples at him and said, well, I've dated a few athletes in my time, <laughs> and of course I'm a fan of the Dallas Cowboys, and that was good enough for him. That's right. He, he figured out a way to – to, that Phyllis didn't have to know X's and O's. They had her do. Uh, they had her interview all the top athletes. She interviewed Roger Staubach and she interviewed Joe Namath, and she became really famous from doing those interviews. And uh, uh, we call and uh, the music pieces on the show. Yeah, we did a tribute to her. Obviously, sad that she passed away uh, last year at uh, only uh, seventy years old, but. Uh, thing about her you liked her i mean you knew she wasn't a big sports uh, expert and when she went on there but but she was very likable obviously and uh, and you enjoyed her conversations with like you said roger strawback kind of a famous interview she did with him right and then uh, with all the athletes yeah. and, and yeah. but but she was never it was never cringeworthy it was always you, know, you enjoyed her and i think women obviously right. liked seeing her too yeah that, i mean that was the whole point as far as bob wessler was concerned uh, who really invented this format uh, and uh, decided to put a woman in the first African American on a live sports show like this. He said, uh, at, <clears throat> leading up to that time, that TV sports had become a male ghetto, mm. all men, wall to wall men. And he thought there was definitely a place for a woman, not just to bring in women viewers, but he said having a woman on a show would improve the chemistry of the show, and better chemistry would lead. To more people watching and and better ratings and he was dead right you know and then when they brought the greek in wow oh, you yeah. talk about personalities who are bigger in life and off the wall the greek was already famous he was probably the most well known of the four of them right um, and uh he came in he you already had a, a, a syndicated column in over 300 newspapers and a syndicated radio show and uh, Pete Rozelle was dead set against any talk of gambling. In fact, he went before Congress and uh, told Congress that only 2% of the viewers actually bet on the games. And when uh, CBS publicist Bino Cook heard that, his response was, if that's true, then they all live on my yeah. block. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about but, it, but, but uh, Jimmy the Greek, uh, I had heard of him before watching football, he'd show up on sometimes talk shows or whatever, sometimes watch my line, whatever, and they'd always ask him the odds and all that kind of thing. So, he, he yeah, I, I even heard of him as a kid. So he was the, yeah, the he best be- known. Yeah. He became famous way back in 1948 when he made a big bet on Harry Truman to right. uh, beat Th- Thomas Dewey. Uh, and he made this bet two weeks before the uh, 48 election uh, for president, and uh, he got 20 to 1 odds. That's how much of a favorite Dewey was. And the reason uh, he he bet on Truman was he was shaving one morning and his sister said, why are you growing a mustache? Don't you know women hate mustaches? It reminds them of <laughs> Hitler. And he said, it reminds them of Hitler. Next thing he looks at the front page of the paper and there's Dewey with a big mustache. 
and he he decides to go out and canvass 500 women at the A&P, and he finds out 400 of them don't like mustaches. <laughs> and he said, and he, he 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 computed the odds. He said Truman's even money, and I'm getting 20 to one. Yeah. So uh, two nights later, uh, Walter Winchell, the most uh, uh, probably the most powerful media person in the country, went on his radio show and announced that. Uh, Jimmy the Greek Snyder from Steubenville, Ohio, was an even bigger winner than Harry Truman. Yeah, <laughs> classic. Uh, I know he also Super Bowl three had a uh, set the odds for that, right? Which was 17, 18 points, right? Jets and Colts. Seven, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he be, probably became more famous for getting that wrong than if he got it right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We won't so, talk too much about Jimmy, but you know, obviously he had a sad ending, and, and you talk about it in the book. We have a limited time, but uh, you, you mentioned before the ratings. D- do you know what the ratings were for that show? Was it like 15, 20 million a week, or what the numbers were? I know that, they were that, huge. That, that's about right. Yeah. Uh, it was very difficult to get uh, ratings out of CBS because they were uh, four, almost 40 years ago, and they had it locked in their vault. And, uh, I was doing the research during the pandemic, they didn't have anyone in the building to go into their vault to get them. But uh, everything I found research-wise was they were getting eights and nines uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, rating points uh, at the time, which transfers to somewhere between 15 and 16 million at least. Yeah, that just for regular for season games. And then you the know, late and games and Thanksgiving were even more. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a great rating today for primetime. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, the regular NFL games and the pregame shows today – would be number one shows, right? Yeah, by a f- by a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. And and we're we're leaving out Herb Cross, uh, and I just wanted to say Herb Cross was the hardest working guy I had ever been associated with. By the way, I, I didn't mention that in 1977 I became a writer for the NFL Today. Right. And I just stayed with CBS for five years, which is why I got to know these people so well. Yeah, Herb Cross always. Uh, Classy guy, never really got ruffled and uh, did those great kind of insight pieces uh, from a former player and uh, really underrated, I think. Kind of sad that people don't remember him as much as they do. Obviously, he passed away earlier this year, but uh, he really did a great job. Yeah, he and he and Brent are working together. That, that was really the definition of the term studio chemistry. You know, and like Phyllis with women broadcasters after her, her really opened the door for black broadcasters after him. And uh, that that's a real good uh, le- part of the legacy of this show. Yeah, the sad and, thing is, with all these pregame shows, all the cable and all that stuff, it's never come close to that, and it, I don't think it ever will. There's just too many people talking at you, yelling at you now. Yeah, and, and all these shows are an hour long, and they, just, they try to shove everything into them. Uh, gambling information, which is really ironic. And uh, all the uh, stuff about um, um, <clears throat> what the play each individual player is going to do uh, in the game, and what wide receiver to take for the day. It's getting to the point where some fans don't even care who wins. It's just how many points did their player right. get? Yeah, I, I didn't uh, mention what? that. The NFL Today show was a half an hour. Sometimes they do a special, I guess, maybe around Thanksgiving. It might be long. I'm not even sure, but it was always a half hour, and that was all you needed. Yeah. They fit it all in the half hour. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Twenty-two minutes of airtime. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I w- I wanted to uh, mention Tony Kornheiser's uh, quote here. Uh, Tony Kornheiser, of course, the great host of uh, ESPN's Pardon the Interruption. Uh, he said that NFL Today show back in 1975 was simply the greatest pregame show of all time, and everybody for the last 40 years has tried to copy it. Yeah, no question about and, it. Yeah. And, uh, that's exactly what what this show did, really. It, it, uh, it There would be no ESPN game day if it wasn't for the NFL today. I mean, they and even NFL 77 over at NBC when they first went to this format, they, they totally tried to copy what we did, including uh, bringing on their own Jimmy the Greek, who was Pete Axel right. at that time. Uh, Doug, I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, anything else before we go? I was going to mention, you, you mentioned briefly the NBC. Yeah, they, they never really got it. I mean, it was okay. It wasn't terrible. It was all right. But they never got uh, close to the level of, uh, of the CBS show back then. You're right about that. 
Uh, when, when they added Brian Gumbel as the host, uh, got better. Later yeah. Costas, it got better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just want to give the title again. You are looking live how the NFL today revolutionized sports broadcasting. And Rich Podolsky is uh, the author and uh, been our guest today. And we could talk for hours on this, but uh, Rich has a life and uh, we got to let him go. But uh, Rich, you want to give out a website? People get this, this book. I guess it's everywhere, right? Uh, the, the book is everywhere. Amazon is stocked up. So is Barnes and Noble. And um, uh, if you want to look for uh, anything from me, I'm uh, at Rich Podolsky on Twitter. And I just wanted to mention that uh, there are other chapters in the book later on that talk about uh, how the, how and why the, the Greek got fired for his right. controversial comments. And then there was uh, Chapter 14, the firing of Brent Musburger, when it, uh, it shocked the world on April Fool's Day of 1990, CBS let him go. Yeah, I remember that day. And, of course, with Jimmy the Greek, uh, sad. But we'll, we'll let, let the people read about that. But uh, just a, a tremendous book and a great job on the research, Rich. And uh, thank you for joining us. Hopefully we can talk to you down the road. And uh, we we'll hope you feel better soon. And uh, we'll talk to you again. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sarasota's one of my favorite places to go in Florida. Oh, great. Look us up next time you come down. <laughs> It'll be great you to bet. meet you. Thank you, Rich. Take care. Take care now. I know.